Welcome to WGN's Honoring Black History, Sharing Our Stories special. I'm Gaynor Hall, and for the next 30 minutes, we're celebrating the past and future of African American contributions to our country. The annual observance has spread around the world, but it got its start right here in Chicago. Lauren Jiggins takes us to the Bronzeville building that is the birthplace of Black History Month. This building was history. Remember the past, restore the promise. It's reflected in every painstakingly restored detail of the former historic Wabash YMCA in Bronzeville. Built in 1911 and completed in 1913, it was largely financed by Julius Rosenwald, the president of Sears Roebuck, and it became the first YMCA for African Americans in the Midwest. Because this was the place. This was the only place. The building often found itself at the intersection of race, perseverance, and progress. So because it was a YMCA, it was considered a safe space. Patricia Abrams is the executive director of the Renaissance Collaborative. They took on the challenge of restoring the building and preserving its history. I just had to take a stance that we will not tear it down and put a marker up and say this was. We just needed to work with uh, everybody to save it, and I think that was a testament of what the Y had meant. This particular building had meant to the African American community from the time it, that it was developed in 1911. And the preservation of history is the heart and soul of this building. It was here at 38th and Wabash that Black History Month was born. Dr. Carter G. Woodson had been barred from attending American Historical Association conferences despite being a dues paying member. Inspired by his experiences at the Y and the Bronzeville neighborhood, he and a small group met here at the YMCA and formed the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. And in 1926, he created Negro History Week. It was really around lifting up those African Americans who had made great contributions to the American society, but they were not recognized as such. Dr. Woodson found little desire amongst white historians to recognize black history, and so he sought to record and preserve those accomplishments on his own. Most of them had been stolen. And you know, when you steal something and put a patent on it, it becomes yours. And while Woodson was preserving history here, the building fueled the present. It was an academic, social, and cultural center. Babies were weighed here. African Americans finally had a place to learn to swim, and women joined the swim team. Pullman porters had a place to sleep, and it was a place for men to collect their paychecks during the race riots. This was considered a safe space. So although people could not cross over State Street, they, they could take the train to work. They could only pick up their checks here. In the ballroom, William Edward Scott unveiled this mural in 1936, a young man in a big city looking at the original YMCA symbol, surrounded by avenues of opportunity. And yet the once bustling rooms here grew quiet and the building fell into disrepair in the 70s. Most of this was in shambles. It was a long journey. The Renaissance Collaborative fundraised and found specialized craftsmen to tackle the intricate details. The community has a role to play in the safety and welfare of future generations. So we saved this building primarily for the people who were going to come afterwards. And it's still a work in progress, but it's a living landmark over 110 years of history that continues today. It's once again a community resource, including supportive housing, job training, and a culinary program. A rebirth for the historic Wabash YMCA. I think when we don't remember our past, we forget from which we've come and how far we've come. Lauren Jiggett's WGN News. It's been performed by everyone from the Mormon Tabernacle Choir to Beyonce and everywhere from George H.W. Bush's presidential inauguration to the Super Bowl earlier this month. The hymn known as the Black National Anthem is on the road to new recognition. Jewel Hillary has more on the song that asks Americans to lift every voice and sing. <laughs> First performed by a group of school children, it should come as no surprise that this beloved piece of American history is the brainchild of a teacher. 
In the year 1900, James Weldon Johnson wrote the poem that would eventually become one of the most recognized songs in the country. It was just one of his many accomplishments. In addition to being a poet, a principal, and a Broadway composer, Johnson was also an attorney one of the first black lawyers admitted to the Florida bar. Originally scripted as part of a school celebration of Abraham Lincoln's birthday, the three-verse hymn was accompanied by music composed by James Weldon Johnson's brother, Rosamond. I think it's just a masterpiece. Lift every voice and sing. Northwestern University music historian Kent R. Brooks says while the words of the song are purposely moving, so is the melody. There's a device in music called text painting or word painting, and it's when you take the melody or chords uh, or harmonies of a song and you line it with the text to create this this imagery that means a lot of different things how the chord makes you feel what emotions the chord can evoke in 1919 during one of the most racially violent periods since the civil war the lyrics were given new life again by educators many of the children who first learned the song went on to become teachers themselves reviving it for a new generation it eventually caught the ear of Booker T. Washington, ushering it to a new height when it was adopted as the official song of the NAACP. Now more than 100 years after its inception, United States Representative Jim Clyburn of South Carolina is pushing a bill to have the song recognized as a national hymn. I came to this Congress 30 years ago, and I've been saying for 30 years, that I was going to do that. It took me <laughs> 29 years to build up enough nerve to introduce the bill, thinking I would get a lot of blowback. Uh, I have not, and I really appreciate that. But even though it was well received, the bill has not made it to the floor for a vote. Representative Clyburn says the rousing lyrics capture the spirit of the democracy's promise. It is uh, shared sacrifices in whatever my experiences may have been and how they contribute uh, to making this one country and making the motto of our country real, which is uh, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. It's not enough just to sing the song every February. I have friends who feel, believe it or not, they, they feel weird singing the song friends who are white who feel weird singing the song because they feel, you know, that's, I, they feel they're number one doing a disservice and they, they're not obviously uh, descended from, from enslaved people. But I think what Representative Clyburn is doing is amazing in that it opens the door, it opens more doors. Let our rejoicing rise. A few years before his death, Johnson wrote, that the lines of the song repay me in elation, almost in exquisite anguish whenever I hear them sung by Negro children. As Americans of every age, faith, and race embrace the song, the anthem's call to action continues to inspire. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. And Representative Clyburn told us he plans to bring the bill to the Congressional Committee again, hoping for more progress the second time around. Still ahead, a look at how black Chicagoans are drawing from the past to influence the future. We'll have more from WGN's Honoring Black History special when we return.